Morning, everyone. Um, good morning to everyone who's joining us online. Um, it's a real blessing, an a, a honour to uh, be able to stand up here and uh, share God's word. Um, our passage for today is 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 to 11. Um, and it reads, This is how we know that we know him, if we keep his commands. The one who says, I have come to know him, and yet doesn't keep his commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly in him the love of God is made complete. This is how we know that we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old command that you have had from the beginning. The old command is the word you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light but hates his brother or sister is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother or sister remains in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother or sister is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Father, we thank you for your word. Um, today, we just pray that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts, Lord, to receive your message. We pray that your word would minister for itself um, and that you just be with us as we come here together to fellowship and to seek you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, so how do we know? Sorry, yes. How do we know? How do we know we're followers of Christ? Um, you know, that's important because over the next eight verses or so, John will address the early church. And personally, as Christians, we should be able to know if Christ has, has, has made a difference in our lives. Um, if our faith has transformed us. So how do we know? If we know him, um, in preparation for today, I was able to step back and take a good look at my life personally uh, through the lens of this passage. And um, just going back to the Gospels, it's, it's, it's amazing to see the consistency between what Jesus taught during his time here on earth and what John is trying to address here in, the, in uh, 1 John chapter 2. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong really with a Christian stopping from time to time and asking themselves, am I doing all right? spiritually um you know not that we're looking for for a sense of perfection um since becoming like christ is a process that we go through but it just signs that god is making a difference in our lives uh, am i obeying his teachings uh is obedience to his word something that i want more than anything else and um on the surface i know from experience obedience can seem like this fleshly checklist um, but it isn't something we can do or accomplish on our own. Uh, John doesn't present it in that way. He presents obedience. He doesn't present it as having something, but rather as knowing someone. Um, here, we, here we read in 1 John uh, 2, verse 3. This is how we know that we know him, if we keep his commands. Um, and it seems really simple, but it's something that... Uh, a lot of people often uh, tend to forget at times. Um, and we know in light of the heretical teachings that were surfacing at the time of the early church, John would want the early church to know this, um, that no matter what heresy found favor in the community at that time, uh, the followers of Christ could know for themselves that they know the Lord. And it's amazing because even now in today, uh, today's society, we can do the same. We can, we can confirm for ourselves whether we know the Lord. Um, so here I have, I was interested to know um, what the statistics are for the Christians. Sorry if you can't see that. Um, I didn't think it would be that small. But uh, I was interested to see what the statistics were for Christians around the world. Um, it's somewhere around two and a half billion Christians, uh, according to World Population Report. Um, and the, these lists here, you see uh, percentages of um, people who identify as Christians in different countries. And uh, you probably can't see it, but as I was reading it last night, some of the countries here have a, claim to have a 99% rate or 99%, 98%. Um, I think 
you can see Greece there as well. Maybe that one's better. Um, just based on population. And as Christians, we would want nothing more for these, for these figures to be accurate, if not better. Um, but it's interesting to think... Uh, It would be good to know um, how many people can say they know the Lord in light of what John's trying to say here in verse 3. We know we know him when we keep his commands. John wants us to know that there is a connection between obedience and knowing God. And for the converse, it's also true that there's a fundamental disconnect between disobedience and knowing God. In Luke 6.26, we see Jesus say, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do as I say? Here we see Jesus saying that to know him as Lord is to do as he says. We often make this mistake of, of just thinking it's a name. I mean, I know I did growing up. I would hear those around me pray to Jesus as Lord. Um, but if we do so, our lives should distinctively show that we are under his lordship. Here we have Webster's definition of Lord. Um, again, sorry if you cannot read that. I will read it out for you. Um, and it's interesting because I, I, I was surprised when I searched this up and I saw it and everything that it was saying was describing what Jesus is meant to be to us. So this is Webster's definition, one having power and authority over others, a, rule of, a ruler by hereditary right or preeminence by whom service and obedience are due. Uh, another one is the owner of land and other real property. And for us as believers, to call Jesus Lord is to do as he says to surrender our hearts to the jurisdiction of Christ. Um, in Matthew 7, verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now again, we see Jesus here making it clear that knowing God, there must be obedience. Jesus isn't saying that salvation is gained by obedience, but rather by surrendering, surrendering to the Lordship of Christ, we naturally will have the willingness to do so. In other words, talk is cheap. We can call him Lord. We can say we're Christians. We can even put our hands up to identify as a statistic. But if there's no acknowledgement of the wisdom and power of God's word, and there's no attempt to walk in it daily or to, or to keep to it, then John would say we, we do not know the Lord. Verse John, 1 John 2, verses 4 to 5. The one who says, I've come to know him and yet doesn't keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly in him the love of God is made complete. This is how we know we are in him. So we see here that John says that through obedience, we confirm that we know the Lord. Jesus also addresses this. In John 14, verse 23, Jesus answers, If some, anyone loves me, he will keep my words. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. So John says that by obedience, we know the Lord. Jesus also says by obedience, we confirm that we love the Lord. Um, verse 5 of 1 John chapter 2. But whoever keeps his word truly in him, the love of God is made complete. In some translations, that may say perfected. But I found an illustration that I believe uh, really puts this in pers into perspective. And it's about the cycle, the circle of God's love. At the top here, we see God, who it starts with and ends with. And he loves us down at the bottom as man. And through our obedience, we show our love back to God. And we know that because we have the freedom to choose, that cycle isn't always completed um, for many people. It might just end halfway where God loves and we don't, complete the, we don't complete the circle, the completion of God's love by walking in obedience to him and showing our love to him. And we know that God loves because John 3 tells us, for God so loved the world. Um, I know that before I surrendered my life to Christ, that cycle wasn't completed. I, I grew up in church and I knew that God loved me because I was always taught it, but I never really attempted to to surrender to the Lordship of Christ and in and, and, and doing so, obey his commands and, and show my love back to him. Um, <clears throat> verse 6, 
of 1 John chapter 2. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. So, that if, so if we say that we abide or remain in him, we will follow his example. There's an attitude that Christ modeled for us while he was here on earth, and that's how to respond to the Father. Uh, in John chapter 6, verse 38, it says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And that's, that's, um, it's a, it's a, it's, that's a, something that, that's amazing to me because this attitude goes against everything that the world tries to teach us today. Um, you, you look around and, and the world tries to disguise self-care and love and appreciation um, today. And it, it's this attitude of do what makes you happy or do as you please, put yourself first. But Jesus makes it clear here. He models for us this attitude that if we abide in the Lord, we know by his example that our purpose here on earth isn't to do what's pleasing to ourselves, but rather to do what's pleasing to the Father, just as Jesus did. Now, from verse 3 to 6, we can see that obedience is how we know we have fellowship with God. But here in verse 7, we are faced with this idea of an old command that is new, but is old, but is still new. Um, and it's, it's old as it has the same virtue that was given to them in the Old Testament. Um, but it's new in how it has been brought to light through the fulfillment in Christ. And by following his example, we can do also to love God and to love one another. Verses 7 to 8. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old command that you have had from the beginning. The old command is the word you have heard. Yet I am writing you a, com a new command, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Um, if you could turn with me to Matthew chapter 22, verse 35. And one of them, an expert in the law, asked a question to test him. Teacher, which one of the commandments in the law is the greatest? He said to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, verse 40. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. Now, Jesus tells us here that these are, the two, uh, these are the greatest commandments. Because really, if we keep to these, we'll keep the others. In some cases, we try to define for ourselves what obedience looks like. And we see this in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit in eternal life? What is written in the law? He asked him. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, he told him. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Now Jesus is asked how, how one can in inherit internal life. He answered on the basis of the law that these experts, they were supposed to be experts in. When they answered, love God, love your neighbor, Jesus confirms that this is the way to eternal life. Because the truth is, if we could keep these, we would inherit eternal life. But we can't. None of us can. But wanting to justify himself, the expert says, who is my neighbor? And I think if we're totally honest, at one point or, or another, we've been in a similar, a similar situation where we try to define obedience for ourselves the person here asks who is my neighbor um trying to justify who he should love and who he shouldn't um in some cases you know it's lord are you sure that uh, that's my neighbor i sure i should show love to that person i i don't get along with him or 
our characters collide. But if we continue to read through 1 John chapter 2, we read how we deceive ourselves when we think like this. Back to 1 John chapter 2, verse 9. We read, The one who says he is in the light but hates his brother or sister is in the darkness until now. And just by reading this verse, we get a sense of how universal hate is. Just as it existed in the times of the early church, it also exists today. How deceptive hate can be. And if not addressed, how it keeps us in the darkness. I myself have experienced this type of hate, um, this type of darkness. And I've seen it consume others. And we, we can be so fixated on the hate that we have for others that we deceive ourselves and we fail to see our own wrong. Or even that we are wrong by even allowing ourselves to hate. Um, a quote that I really like that I found recently is from Charles Spurgeon. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Um, For us to hate those in error or talk of them with contempt or wish them ill or do them wrong is not according to the spirit of Christ. You cannot cast out Satan by Satan, nor correct error by violence, nor overcome hate by hate. The conquering weapon of a Christian is love. Now, 1 John chapter 2, verse 10, we read that the one who loves his brother or sister remains in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. And the more we desire, to, desire the, the obedience and fellowship with God, the more we walk in the light. And we read that there is no cause for stumbling in him. And when we do face hate from, one another, from, from another person, we respond with love and empathy where we would once reciprocate hatred. This response is because we walk in the light and understand how darkness can blind people. And it's, it's a beautiful thing um, when we repay evil with good, hatred with love, that by showing love for one another, especially in the face of hatred, in doing so, we have the peace of knowing that we are following the will of God and in light of what John is telling us here in chapter 2 of 1 John, when we do so, we walk in obedience, which means that we know the Lord. And that's all we really want, isn't it? To, to come to know the Lord, to get closer, to have fellowship with him every day. Last verse of, sorry, verse 11 of chapter 2. But the one who hates his brother or sister is in the darkness, walks in the darkness and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Father, thank you for the opportunity today to come together in fellowship, um, to read here in 1 John chapter 2. Lord, we just pray that you would allow us to take something from this um, to help us, Lord, to uh, keep your commands, to keep your teachings, Lord, that we would come to know you, that we would show our love to you, Lord, that people would know by the things we do that we are followers of Christ. Um, I just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.